Before I begin, um, I'd just like to acknowledge that the land that we are on right now is unceded territory, and I'd like to pay my respects to Wondery elders past and present. Um, so I'll begin by just giving you a really quick, quick overview to the actual critical program, um, just so you know the broader context for um, this discussion. But basically, the program is dedicated to sort of furthering the professional development of um, creative practitioners by looking at thematic discourses um, and talking to a broad range of practitioners um, whose works are um, often kind of varied but not not disparate. There's a lot of kind of interesting synchronicities um, to everyone's practice that I think you will kind of see as the night wears on. I'll introduce the panel in a second. Um, tonight's discussion is quite varied because um, each practitioner um, has quite a you know, varied practices themselves, but also varied interests from architecture through to virtual spaces, through to interactive works, through to public art. So it's going to be quite a varied discussion. I'll now go around and introduce everyone. So over here I have Claire McCracken, and Claire is an artist doing her PhD um, at RMIT, and she's done a variety of different projects for RMIT, the Chinese consulate in Shanghai, Knox City Council, and Fed Square. And tonight I'll be talking to her about a um, project that she did called Section 32. I've mentally blanked on for which council. Knox City Council, cool. Um, and then next we have um, Ari Glory, who is the program manager at Testing Grounds, but who's also a, um, an artist and a curator as well. He has performed at a lot of different things. Um, I won't read this entire list, otherwise we'll be here for a while. But he's done things with Gertrude Street Pro Projection Festival, Channels, White Night Melbourne, Melbourne Now, West Space. He's done stuff for King's Artist Run. Um, the Margaret Lawrence Gallery, and he's also um, done a lot of interesting curatorial projects, one of which that I'll be kind of focusing on tonight is called Love City, which was a, um, I guess you'd kind of call it a triennial kind of festival of um, interactive and performative and site-specific works. Um, next to me, we have Zoe Bastin. Um, Zoe is an artist who is also doing her PhD at RMIT, and she's shown at Tinning Street, Paradise Hills, Substation, and RMIT, as well as an upcoming project at Testing Grounds with Ari. Um, but tonight, I will be asking her some specific um, questions about a project she did um, out at, it was called Treatment, and it was with Wyndham City Council, and so many city councils to remember. Um, and um, you guys might recognize um, the work that we're gonna be talking about was in the cover photo for the Facebook event and on social media and that kind of thing. Um, and that was a performative work that she did with um, a collaborator, Laura Barton. And finally, we have Colby Vexler, who is um, part, one of the co-founders of Parallel Space for Thinking, which is a critical platform that kind of talks about, I guess, a variety of different kind of cultural criticisms from architecture through to you know, fine art, through to philosophy, through to fashion and literature. And they do work um, a lot in digital spheres, including um, you know, running things like live streamed conversations and things like that. But Colby himself has a background as a graduate architect and um, teachers with Melbourne Uni. So that's a really quick introduction of everyone. But now what I might start to do is ask for um, our panel members to tell us a little bit more about um, their practices. Zoe, I might start with you. Zoe, could you tell us a little bit about some of your um, conceptual concerns within your practice? I mean, I feel weird starting off. Um, I... I have a sculptural background as well as a, I'm a trained contemporary dancer and I'm a dance teacher. So my practice is kind of a merging of the two as sculptural performance. Um, and that cover photo was a part of a project called Treatment, which was at the Werribee Treatment Plant, which was a live performance and big sculptural installation that investigated kind of tropes of the feminine in contemporary photography and like use of the body in feminist practice and that's what my work is mainly rooted in um, material investigations to make large sculptural works um, that talk about the body and the way that we use it um, so 
I think I'm just going to speak mostly about um, parallel for thinking, which is sort of the, the bigger sort of context of the parallel space for thinking, um, which is basically, as Katie said, this critical platform that um, mainly operates at the moment through two formats, one being the parallel space for thinking, which is a physical location in the um, Nicholas building, and then our website as well, which um, sort of has extensions via Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. Um, and basically the idea is that, as the name suggests, it's interested in the idea of parallelity. So um, we look at this through mainly three key lenses, which is uh, this idea of difference, distance, um, and sort of disconnection. And so we look at, um, rather than trying to amalgamate a series of different things, like the, the virtual or the digital and the physical or different disciplines, whether it's art, um, architecture, philosophy, literature, um, or different representations. We're actually interested in sort of looking at them in parallel spectrums and starting to examine maybe those differences and looking at how those things might have moments of transference. Um, for example, whether it be through slippages or tensions um, or misalignment. So we're sort of not interested in necessarily bringing them together to sort of say they're all the same thing, but examining how they coexist. Okay, Ari, do you want to... Um, so I um, have a okay. So as an independent uh, visual artist, um, I mainly work around video and performance. Um, with that, it's often to do with uh, repetition um, and image making through simple gesture. Um, as a curator, um, as an independent curator, um, I look a lot at the exhibition making um, and White Cube Gallery is an actual form and I'm really interested in exhibiting outside of White Cube Galleries and tensions between theatre spaces um, and White Cube Galleries as well. Um, and then as a, as a, what I would call a professional practice, my nine to five job, um, I'm really interested again in looking at alternative spaces um, and really looking at how um, space uh, and infrastructure can support artists to develop projects. Hi, um, so I'm a site specific artist, so I predominantly work outside the gallery, um, although I do occasionally move into the gallery. Um, and I'm really interested in um, changing spaces, so I'll often take over um, air, cities at points in transition. Um, and I guess you'd call my practice socially engaged in that I often work quite close with communities. Um, however, not always, but there's also um, potentially a bit of an anthropological angle to that work in the way that I might um, work with communities to tell stories. Thanks, guys. Um, I might now ask sorry, a quick question about treatment, just to give you guys some context if you didn't get a chance to make it out there. Um, treatment was um, a project where... How many artists? Was it 10? 10 different artists... Um, responded to the Werribee sewage plant and um, made works, was it about six months that you had in lead up time for preparation? And I went along to see that um, performance and so to give you guys a little bit of kind of an idea of what it um, was composed of, um, we caught a minibus around the treatment plant and Zoe's um, performance was one of the first ones that we saw and um, she and Laura were performing in, a I mean Zoe can probably tell you a bit more of the context better than I can, but within abandoned kind of pipes and different um, industrial infrastructure. Um, and then um, we kind of went through the different um, different areas of the exhibition and kind of saw a few other artists work. And then we came to what used to be uh, the Korowak Town Hall. Um, and Zoe will probably tell you a bit more about that, but she exhibited um, some sculptural works, which um, not only involved um, work infrastructure, again, that was abandoned from the site, but also um, some materials that are quite specific to her work. So is quite known for using materials such as rubber and latex and flour, sometimes pearls, fur, a lot of um, 
quite sort of bodily um, materials, whether they evoke the body or whether they speak directly to having been worn on the body previously. Um, but I think one of the things that I'd really like to know a little bit more about is as a practitioner, having quite a long lead up time to kind of think about this site, I'd love to know a little bit more about your thinking um, in response to the site and how you developed the performance and installation that you did develop. Um, so we, I was commissioned for this work and a group of artists were asked to go to the treatment plant and we caught a minibus out the first time that we were there as well um, and pick a site that we wanted to respond to. And I am very much a gallery-based artist usually, so I found this process very difficult. Um, so I picked two sites and my work kind of existed across them and talked about the difference between them. Um, and the first one, as Katie mentioned, was a pipe junkyard. Um, the Melbourne treatment plant is a place that doesn't usually have public access. It's 40 k's wide. It's a massive farm. And they have their own chip, which is what this junkyard space was. So I really liked there's these big concrete pipes, as you probably saw in the cover photo, um, that kind of look like big minimalist sculptures um, that I wanted to respond to. So we developed a performance work that put the body back in that space because this land exists as like a public place that the public of that community doesn't have access to in a really strange way, um, which is probably a good way to talk about the town hall, which is the other site for the work. Um, there used to be a township that all the Melbourne water workers lived at and this town hall functioned as their kind of community gathering place and there were 600 people that lived there until 1970 when the infrastructure of the treatment plant itself um, kind of mechanic mechanicized is that the right word and um, everything so the workers weren't needed anymore so there's kind of this strange ghost town leftover place with this community hall that's still fully intact but looks like it should exist in the mid 60s um, so I kind of did some research into the histories of that place and what the hall was used for and what things might have happened there and wanted to put the body in sculptural form back into that site and also draw parallels between the two places. So bringing junk from the junkyard into the community hall and we also took photographs um, of the performance on the junkyard and they were framed and installed in the kitchen of the hall. So the work kind of talked about both places. Um, yeah, and I guess I found this very challenging but rewarding engaging with a local community and trying to imagine a community that wasn't there anymore and kind of the things that might have happened and that was very much how I informed the content of the work. Thank you. Um, so now, Colby, I think I'm going to ask you a quick question about how parallel space for thinking kind of came to be but more specifically than that I'm kind of interested in you know whenever anyone starts up an initiative um, you know usually that comes from a, a sense that there is a hole that isn't being filled and I'm kind of interested if you could tell us a little bit about what you felt that was missing from current cultural criticism and current cultural thinking um, in Melbourne and I guess more, more broadly if you wanted to tell us a little bit about that. Um, so I think Parallel came about from a sort of a reactionary tension initially. So the, th the three founding members are sort of all have an architecture background um, and we were really interested in this idea of discourse. And I think there was a lot of amazing work that was happening, but it was more so um, to do with the built environment and architecture industry. Um, and then we sort of uh, became interested in sort of um, we were really fortunate that our uh, architecture education was sort of seated within the um, art and design faculty at Monash. So um, very quickly we started to become familiar with sort of the existence of um, contemporary art platforms that were happening locally and then sort of it expanded larger into sort of a global understanding. And um, there was really interesting things happening, but we thought that there was quite a strong um, disconnect between the content being discussed and generated in the mediums that um, it actually came about in. So, for example, um, there was a lot of content talking about globalisation, 
um, all sorts of um, like a global contemporary culture, but um, the type of co uh, the content being generated was at a very physical centralized location, for example, New York or London, um, in sort of context like this, but you needed to be in the room at the time in order to engage with it or wait for an extended period of time in order to have access to it. And so Parallel tried to create, again, based on these sort of ideas of um, different uh, distance and disconnect, some sort of um, connection between the content and the mediums being generated. So um, the first step was to create a, um, I guess ironically, like a physical space, but in order to decentralize the location. So um, setting up a live stream sort of apparatus and a, a space that instantly hosts and transmits content means it sort of isn't about what happens in the room, it's about how the stuff inside the room has an influence or engagement with a larger community. Um, so yeah, I think it sort of came about in that particular way, the sort of like a reaction and understanding and it sort of expanded into a scale and how we sort of were able to um, transmit that or, or transcribe that into sort of some sort of um, outcome. Thank you. Um, now I'd like to ask um, Ari a question about um, Love City, actually. And um, I think I was fortunate to see two of the three Love Cities. And um, at the time, I didn't know m many people that were kind of working in such a committed site-specific way. Um, but these were quite discursive events that kind of lasted over several hours and involved a huge variety of different um, performances. And obviously, um, a project like this is a really big amount of work for a single practitioner to undertake. And usually, um, you know, in order to sort of to get that off the ground, it usually comes out of, again, in, in a similar line to the question I asked about to Colby, about that idea of there being a gap or there being a reason why this project needs to happen now. And I'm kind of curious um, to know a little bit more about that. So I guess um, Love City, it's, it's feeling, feeling a need is, is an interesting one for this project. Um, Love City is something that evolved kind of organically um, and, and as each year went by that for me it was almost like not knowing why I was doing it but finding out things along the way. Um, for those that don't know what it was, um, it was three artist run festivals over three years, uh, for, uh, 2014, 15 and 16. Um, it actually started from me securing a, a really, really large warehouse space in the middle of Chinatown for a solo exhibition um, and going, oh shit, I can't feel this. <laughs> and then opening that up to, well, why don't I get a bunch of other artists to join me? I'd only ever done one other curatorial project at this point. Um, and then that kind of grew and grew and grew until I think I had 25 projects. Um, those artists invited other artists. Um, you know, so all of a sudden we had o over 30, close to 40 artists involved. Um, and out of that emerged this, this idea, um, really around, I guess, collective activity. Um, I'd always been interested, kind of always wanted to start my own gallery, but didn't want to add to the, the plethora of artist-run initiatives that are already out there. Um, so for me, this was a way to, to kind of, I realised at that point, to sink my teeth into that. It was also a time when the Sydney Biennale went through the big controversy. Um, so I got my little activist hat on um, and, and spoke a lot. I did a speech at the opening Love City, spoke a lot about how, you know, uh, as funding gets ripped out of things, um, that really all you do need is a space and, and a bunch of artists that are uh, that are willing to do things. And you know, as as much as this sounds funny to say now, because I work for the government, um, but as as much as as much as you can have your policies and and all these sort of things, art really is about um, ground level work um, and people just coming to share things. And and in that temporary nature of it, so the events only went for four or five hours that maybe you don't need to spend an extraordinary amount of money on materials to make really great art. Maybe it's just really about that moment. You know, we used really threadbare materials, um, but there was a great energy to it. Um, yeah. Um, so um, now I'm 
I'd like to ask Claire a little bit more about Section 32, and I guess not just, I, I'm, I'm really interested, one, in um, the development of the project, but also, as you kind of said, um, your practice is often engaging with communities that, for whatever, are kind of at a point of tension or a point of kind of either convergence or divergence, and so it would be kind of interesting to hear not just how the project developed, but how it developed within the specific context that it developed. And if you maybe also just want to give them like a bit of a visual description of what the project was as well, just so that they can kind of picture it in their heads while, the, while you're talking. So um, section 32 was located in the suburb of Baronia, which is about 35 kilometres from Melbourne CBD. And um, you know we're all really aware of the expanding city when we um, when we walk around the urban space at the of the CBD at the moment. We can see the new metro tunnel happening, um, and a whole series of developments that are on the news each night. Um, Baronia is part of this rapidly expanding city. So, you know, Melbourne by 2050 will double in scale. We're going to um, between eight and nine million people. So we're rapidly becoming a, a mega city. Um, Baronia is a post-Second World War suburb. Um, it's quarter acre blocks with houses in the middle of them. As part of this kind of city expansion, developers have um, landed in Baronia. It has a train line. Um, and those quarter acre blocks are being bought up for extraordinary amounts of money because it's not um, ordinary people buying them, it's developers. The, quarter, the house in the middle of the quarter acre block is being demolished. And for the first time, that suburb is seeing um, medium density going in, particularly where um, it's close to public transport. So as you can imagine, when you pick up the, the Knox Leader, which is a lovely Murdoch Press um, <laughs> newspaper, the first half is full of um, incredibly angry articles about this changing suburb, you know, um, developments overshadowing my vegetable patch, um, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then you flip the other half, and the, the only reason that publication exists is off real estate. So the other half of the magazine is like feeding the fuel. <laughs> so the, the, the newspaper is both totally pro and po totally against um, um, the development. Anyway, I, I, you know, somewhat sit on the fence because I'm, I acknowledge that um, it's not sustainable to compete, to continue sprawling, and that we need to really rethink the way we've constructed our city. But Knox City Council rang me to say that a developer who was going to be demolishing the house eventually, subject to planning, um, had given them a house for artists to use, and um, perhaps I could come in and put some frames on the wall of that house. And I said, no, I think we can do much better than that, particularly if you can find me funding. I'm really interested in, in what is happening to the Australian suburbs right now and um, thinking about the role of artists in this, in this development context. Um, so I pitched an idea that I created an immersive installation that transported audiences to the end of um, this century to have a vision of um, the Australian suburbs um, with the idea that I might be able to get a a different type of discourse happening than that in the newspaper. Um, a discourse around how suburbs like Baronia are planning for climate change, how um, they're planning for creating um, strong public social spaces as the quarter acre blocks disappear. Um, and Baronia is kind of unique in that climate change gets talked about a fair bit because it's pinned up against the Dandenongs. So they are actually really, particularly post Black Saturday, really aware of um, how that suburb will change and there's, there's quite clear forecasts on how those events will shift and increase over, over time. So it's kind of where density hits the bush. Um, so I, obviously it was a huge job. So um, I, I moved, I had to move into the house in order to deal with planning. So, but that, that turned out to be fantastic. And I lived in the house for a month because I've never lived in the suburbs. Um, and I think it made it a far more sensitive project because I actually got to know the neighbours and I got to understand that um, while the newspaper is so vitriolic about the development that other people you know, have very vastly different opinions ab about it. So I was able to kind of build the work off, off that far better information. Um, was in there for four and a half weeks and transformed it into this installation with a group of um, other artists. Um, so there was a sound artist involved, so it was a full com composition. Um, I was largely in charge of kind of the conceptual development and the visual um, element, but we also worked with 
three um, performers, one dancer and two actors, and so there was a person managing them separately, directing them and writing a small script so that when you entered the house, um, it was a slightly apocalyptic vision of the future, but um, it was inhabited by real people who couldn't talk to you and wouldn't. They would just walk past and make a cup of tea. Thanks for that, Claire. Um, I'm now going to jump to Colby really quickly. And this is a question that does certainly relate to parallel, but also relates to your own personal relationship to, to the internet and social media. But obviously this, um, the broader critical program is interested in critical discourse and in Australia at the moment, um, we're especially in the fine arts sector, we're at a very interesting stage. Obviously there's a lot of funding that's been cut, but a lot of you might have seen um, a lot of the cuts that have just taken place in a lot of the um, newspapers at the moment. Um, and I can't remember how much has been cut from the Fairfax media, but there's been a lot of talk suggesting that most of the people that are gonna go in this initial stage are arts critics, basically. and so criticism is in a very changing sphere. And I mean, obviously, because of the way media is today, you know, um, certain kinds of print journalism is, some people would say, declining anyway. But my interest is kind of in the future of criticism. And if we are um, living and working in a climate where maybe there's not a huge public demand for arts writing, for, for critical discourse, um, I'm kind of interested in thinking about what what's kind of happening next, and I know both parallel but yourself as well use social media as a kind of way of documenting research-based practices but also kind of interrogating how how you might convey a critical idea you know whether it's through an Instagram post or, or live feed or something like that um, and so I'm really curious your thoughts on um, you know the kind of projects that you've been doing but also you know whether you think this could be an interesting future for kind of um, current critical discourse. Sure. Um, I mean, I think, it, yeah, for sh it definitely does. And I think um, in order to sort of consider it in that way, it, it needs to be sort of considered not so much a space in itself, so, um, but more so like, again, an apparatus. So I was speaking about the idea that the parallel space for thinking isn't necessarily considered a container. It's sort of an apparatus to project or to bring in sort of content. And I think that, uh, say, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook sort of is the same thing in a way. Um, it, it sort of creates in-between networks between um, something that I may post in Melbourne um, and someone else has access to, at the, like, as soon as I post it in, say, London or wherever it is. Um, and I think that that helps this idea of, like, the decentralization that I was talking about. Um, and I think that it definitely does have a future in sort of um, a, a critical element or, like, a a critical avenue, um, but at the moment, I think like it, it, um, it sort of operates still very much so as like an aesthetic and descriptive sort of platform, particularly Instagram. Um, quite often, like the idea that the like the predominant uh, medium is the the image. Um, you know, most people kind of post stuff and then don't write much of a caption, or the caption is just a description or telling you what the image is, as opposed to sort of really using it. Um, to, to describe what the image is, and I, kind of, I find that really interesting. I mean, Twitter, on the other hand, sort of has much more of a critical aspect to it, um, and it sort of is used more so in uh, academic spheres, um, and it actually has a limit to the amount that you can write, whereas Instagram's limit is far larger. It's, it does have a limit, but it's much um, larger, and yet people still don't really tend to use it that much to write or explain or criticize or analyze particular content. Um, so I find that it is happening, but it's sort of slower, and I think it's because the interface wasn't initially conceived to do those types of things. Um, but yeah, for sure, I think it's definitely got a really strong um, uh, potential to have those sort of engagements on it. Um, obviously, um, I, think, I think that's a really interesting response, and um, just to kind of chat really quickly about the Russian, the kind of curatorial rationale or the um, conceptual rationale for this talk is kind of about spatiality, but in it, in in all the possible iterations that that could take place. So whether it it is a virtual space, whether it's a mental, like a temporal space, um, and so just to kind of go on from that, um, thinking about 
temporal spaces, I'd like to chat to Zoe. <laughs> I actually wrote a review for her treatment show and one of the things that I'd started to think about in relation to her practice was this kind of expanded sense of temporality within your sculptural, performative um, and interactive works. Um, Zoe often um, might, for example, perform in her studio and then document that and then that documentation might be present in some way um, in further performances. Um, and so for treatment, you, you will have seen her perform and then you might go and look at the objects that she's made, but then there's also further um, you know, documentation of previous performances and there is this kind of sense of time kind of collapsing in on itself. Um, and I'm kind of interested in uh, time itself seems to have a very physical presence in your work. And so I'm kind of interested in hearing more about your thoughts on sort of the space of temporality within your practice. Hmm, where to start? Um, I think the important context for my practice is my creative dance background, which very much um, is about intuitive movement. And in classes, we like set up a scene, and then you're encouraged to kind of perform within that. And they're usually not documented, and they just exist for that space and time. And I have done that since I was a very small child. So that was kind of my um, modus operandi for performance. And when I started at art school and when I started becoming a sculptor, I wanted to bring that kind of methodology of performing as a small space of time, as a live event to my sculptural practice, um, which means that I don't often make objects that last a long time. I really like using objects that, uh, I really like using materials that don't last anyway. Um, some, of the pro some of the materials I use for treatment um, I used lychees and cherries that were dipped in plasticine and they got really mouldy on about day two. And sometimes I used dough, which like yeastily rises and then collapses. Um, so I liked these materials that had an element of time in themselves and would degrade. But I also, um, the way that I make work um, is to kind of make these sculptures and then dismantle them and use the materials for something else. And using those materials is often for performances as props as well. So they kind of get recycled through my practice, which meant that I was kind of um, forced to document my work really well and forced to use photography a lot to preserve it because it physically doesn't exist. Um, and also I really liked the method of doing that and working out different ways to manipulate that in kind of my way of storytelling, I guess. Um, so for treatment, we organized a photo shoot that was about a month in advance of the performance itself as our like first on-site investigation um, to develop those still photo works that would then be shown with the live performance to create this kind of collapse of time, but also to bring that element of documentation and photography into the work, because otherwise it would all just be live. Um, and yeah, I just started a new series of work that was somewhat prompted by Katie's comment in this review, which we've been talking about a lot, um, of uh, like showing a photograph of an object and then using the materials that were made, that were assembled to create that sculpture, like in the space and then photograph it again. So we get this kind of like time inception thing that I'm definitely still working out, but I think has potential. And I definitely think that there was a sense of kind of uncanniness seeing some of the documentation of Zoe's performance because I saw treatment on a day when it was just like really grey, pouring with rain and um, Zoe and Laura were wearing these kind of white linen clothing that obviously a lot of the pipes that they were dancing and moving about and in and on top of were rusted and so, you know, I think I got there on like really the morning or the mid-afternoon of the first day and you were already kind of covered in rust and dirt, which did mean that the moment you saw them, you kind of felt that they'd always been there and that was kind of their home. And then coming through to see the second um, part of the exhibition, you see photos of them against this like amazing azure blue sky, which kind of seemed to kind of fortify the idea that, you know, you and Laura were these kind of odd fictional characters that had just eternally lived in this really odd space. Yeah, there was, um, 
there was a little girl on the second day and like after our last performance we got changed and we were like at one of the other works and just being pedestrian people and this like four-year-old girl ran up to us and she was like the pipe girls you escaped you escaped it's okay now <laughs> I was like ah it works it's great um thanks for that anecdote <laughs> um I have a question for Ari about about some of the work that you're doing at testing grounds specifically. Um, I happened to overhear a conversation the other day where someone was talking about um, South Bank and the arts precinct and I um, was, there was some tourists nearby and they were like, oh, apart from the NGV, like where, where else can I go? And someone said, I actually think you should go to testing grounds you'll probably have a far more interesting time than you'll have at the NGV, which I was like, oh, got to go tell Ari that. No, I'm telling you in a public sphere. But my question is, um, I'm kind of curious, obviously um, working there, you're kind of immersed in this amazing environment. If for, the, if for anyone that might not know Testing Grounds, although I'm sure a lot of you do, um, it, I guess Ari would probably do a better explanation of this, but it is a site which is kind of an apparatus for artists and pra different practitioners to kind of um, test out different elements of their practice but it's also a space for recreation because they have a sort of bar and like um, you know barista machine and things like that and so it's this really interesting kind of convergence between a kind of recreation space and a um, and a sort of space not only for exhibition making but also for um, for bringing people together and you know I, I definitely um, uh, I was at an opening there quite recently and there's a very different atmosphere to a testing grounds opening in comparison to many of the other openings I've been to. I think also you're not in a white cube at testing grounds because although there are some sort of uh, gallery uh, sort of buildings, um, most of testing grounds is open air. Um, but it also seems to kind of bring people together in a really interesting way and I think... Um, it definitely seems to be sitting in a different bubble from the rest of a lot of the art world. But I'm really curious about um, your observations surrounding the way that people interact with work at testing grounds because it is in this kind of, it is this hybrid kind of site. And just your thoughts on where it kind of sits, um, not only within like the broader arts community, but maybe also within an artist's trajectory of their practice. So I guess um, it's, it's, I could talk, that's like a whole PhD. A lot of people are writing, their, we have a few people writing their PhD on testing grounds. Um, testing grounds, I guess, uh, can I get a show of hands of who's been down to testing grounds in its new, in the last six months? Yeah. <laughs> so I guess um, we shut down over winter last year, got a substantial infrastructure upgrade. Um, and since then, we've been operating in a very different way. And what we, uh, Testing Grounds is, is um, the official t tagline for Testing Grounds is Temporary Infrastructure Research Project. Um, so the site, as you said, it's a social space. It's as much about placemaking that it is about providing a space for art. So in that, um, it is as much about, you know, unlike, unlike, say, going to the NGV or ACA, that you go in one door, you see the exhibition, and then you get spat out the other end. It's very much about, hey, come down, see some art, but also sit and have a beer, have a coffee, have, a, you know, do some reading, have a meeting here, bring your baby down, bring your dog down, just, just hang out. When the doors are open, we are like a public park. In that, it's really interesting in creating this sort of space is um, there's a lot of tensions in it because you have to deal with everybody's desires. Um, you have... One, of course, we are there to service artists, so you're dealing with what they want to do with the public space. Um, two, you're dealing with people that want to use it purely as a social space. Three, you're dealing with people that stumble across it and have absolutely no idea what it is. Four, you also deal with people that have absolutely no interest in art. Five, <laughs> you deal with uh, a lot of people that think it should be a garden. <laughs> which is which is a, a common one, surprisingly, even though there's acres and acres of gardens across the road. Um, uh, so the way you know, we we often talk about testing grounds then as 
as somewhere that sits in a kind of slippage between a, a public space but also an arts venue um, as a space for one-to-one -one testing for public art. So here, and the, the design of Testing Ground is really built to reflect this that Millie Catlin, the architect and the creative director could talk about a lot more, um, is that it is designed to reflect this. So there's a reason why we don't have a big roof over it. Um, it's a reason why it's a big wide open space and that's so that the public can see artists trying and testing these things out. There's purposely no back of house, so you can't hide anywhere. Uh, you, it's not about pre-making your work and then and then kind of plonking it into the space. It's about building it from the ground up and, and the public being able to see that. So that sort of space we are finding is shifting the way that artists have to think about the way they work quite a lot. Um, and a, and a, as a state-funded project funded by Creative Victoria, we are also dealing with artists that come from, uh, you know, that are currently at university at all levels of practice. Um, we deal with artists that have never been to university before. We're now dealing with a lot of regional artists and now we're dealing with interstate artists. And we're also dealing with performance makers, theatre makers, writers, installation artists, painters. Um, so a big part of this open space as well is, is um, kind of giving opportunity for artists to learn how to deal with different disciplines. Um, and getting critiques from different disciplines as well. One of the in most interesting things that happen in these sorts of spaces is, you know, is it actually that interesting as a painter to hear what another painter thinks about your work? Our kind of ethos as testing grounds is no, it's actually not. What's more interesting is to hear what a dramaturg thinks about your work. Um, yeah, I've kind of lost where I was, but. <laughs> Great response. Um, Claire, I'm about to ask you a question, and it kind of just popped into my head um, this evening. But I was thinking a lot about how everyone talks about, you know, the past, the most previous uh, critical of, um, panel talk we had was on hybrid practice, and people often talk about hybridity and convergence and the fact that most artists don't have one discipline anymore and that, you know, that the limits of practice are kind of melding into one another. And obviously that's a kind of best case scenario. But one of the things that I find interesting that I know you and I have kind of spoken about before is the weird like box that people seem to place um, artists that work in with public art. Um, you know, people often describe artists that work in the public sector as like public artists. Um, and I'm kind of really curious, it seems like a very, to me, it seems like a very arbitrary distinction to make and a very odd one. But I'm kind of interested um, in your thoughts on that and, um, you know, like why you kind of might think that that might be. Um, but, um, yeah. Um, yeah, I've always been kind of puzzled about the categorisation and I, I think it's actually a real local thing because I didn't do a fine arts degree. I did a course that's gone now from Melbourne Uni called Creative Arts and it had a practice component but it was mainly cultural theory and that was an incredible course because it taught me how to write and read and all these wonderful things but is actually in many ways kind of dogged my career the whole way when it comes to entering the gallery scene. And this is not an unusual thing for creative arts graduates to talk about. It was also interdisciplinary. So it was theatre, fine arts, creative writing and media. Um, and so I, I guess over the years I've kind of dipped my toe into the gallery scene, but it can be very hard for me to even get a look in with applications. And I find it kind of extraordinary that local government will give me or Creative Victoria or Ozco will give me up to $100,000 and I can't get into a tiny artist run space because my practice doesn't necessarily speak that language that they're looking for and I don't have this kind of undergraduate in fine arts. Um, and it, it was a huge problem when I came to doing a PhD because I was like, I, I want to do it in fine arts because I'm an artist. And it took me 12 months of negotiation to get my foot in the door and literally every door I knocked on, everyone was like, but are you an artist? Because you haven't got a fine arts degree. Um, and interestingly, because I lecture in the art and public space department at RMIT, so we're part of fine arts, but I'm the first person to do my PhD not in architecture and to do it in fine arts. I'm really puzzled by the division. It drives me up the wall. 
Um, <laughs> I, I would just like to be known as an artist and I would love the opportunity to operate in the gallery scene as much as I really enjoy the opportunities I have doing site-specific works. And look, kind of goes back to your discussion about getting a diverse critical discourse happening. I mean, that is the fantastic thing about breaking up these boundaries. I think there is one, just to kind of conclude, there is one simple reason why some commercial gallery sectors would say, you know, not public art, and that is that, of course, they think that it devalues your work. Um, so that would be kind of one idea that, that plays out in that, although I'd say more kind of funky and contemporary commercial art galleries are now seeing the value in public art because, you know, it's one of those odd industries in the arts where you get paid up front <laughs> and you get paid an artist fee. It's a really good deal compared to forking out all your cash, making all your artwork and putting it on the walls of the gallery and hoping that you'll sell a few works and then losing commission on those works. I think, um, I, I, I think you brought, brought up a really good point there about, um, you know, the difference why commercial galleries say or other institutions don't like public art or, or art that sits in those weird in-between spaces and that's and that's really comes down to financial pressures. Um, the reason why testing grounds um, can afford to really offer an extremely multidisciplinary space that can really be quite um, robust in its experimentation is because we are fortunate enough to be funded for the next three years. Um, so we don't have the same financial pressures that a lot of other organisations have to keep their doors open. Um, and we were talking about this just before the talk um, started, that we're also a temporary space at testing grounds, and that is something that's really key. And, if, um, and there, was a, there was actually a discussion that happened down at testing grounds last week um, as a part of an act of showing by, curated by Annabelle Lacroix and a lot of people were talking about creating uh, creative spaces. Um, how do you do that and how do you, how do you how do you ma how do you maintain that? Because so often these spaces, for lack of a word, kind of fail. But there was also a lot of discussion around that that actually maybe they haven't failed, and we need to think about creative spaces as, as something that's often a lot more temporal, um, and that because they do their thing, and really once they've done their thing, they will go away. And I think there's a real problem. Um, maybe not. A a problem. <laughs> we need lots of creative spaces. We need lots of different types of creative spaces. It's not that, you know, white cubes are bad or, or anything like that. Um, but a lot of spaces, you know, have been around for a very long time and we're getting into these spaces now that are quite stagnant and not enough critical kind of discourse around them. Yeah, and I think, um, I think that it, it can be quite frustrating as a creative practitioner because the government works in a very bureaucratic sense and I mean I, I don't know the other day at work I had to make a list of artists that were like differentiate between artists that were emerging and mid-career and established and it just felt like the one the grossest and two most confounding exercise to do because it just there were a lot of holes I think I think maybe the arts industry on a practice level is changing at a really rapid pace and I think the bureaucracies that are supposedly supporting supporting us aren't, aren't keeping up with, with those changes. Yeah, I think um, that's an interesting thing to note because Section 32 wasn't funded by cultural services. It was funded by the city planning department. And if I look at my funding over the last 10 years, over 50% is not funded by the cultural area. It's funded because it's seen as really valuable contribution contribution to research outside those areas and even um, at my confirmation recently one of the major criticisms was this idea that I wasn't giving back to the art world I was giving back to society what a tragedy <laughs> and yet I can cross the road and have these great conversations with um, urban Sub sustainability department and and kind of see real collaborations and I think you know that's another interesting thing for artists to really flesh out is what role do they play beyond the walls of the white cube beyond the School of Art and how can they contrib co contribute to these larger discourses? Um, I might open up the, like another uh, question to the panel, which I kind of already asked Colby, but about your, I don't know, kind of in a speculative sense, 
um, you've kind of, all of you have kind of touched on some kind of key, you know, either issues that artists are facing individually or in a broader kind of sense. And I'm kind of curious, um, for example, maybe Ari, I'll start with you, maybe what, having worked with testing grounds and having worked with a huge range of different organisations, you know, where you see the future of artists' practice could be in, in terms of a sustainability of career and in terms of generating networks for support. Um, you know, like, for example, when testing grounds is no longer, I, like, do you think it has set a stage for further kind of projects of its kind? And I mean, it's a, um, it's a, a big thing to speculate on. <laughs> I guess um, in in the way that I can talk about that from from my point of view of testing grounds is that um, it's really interesting to look at the creative state strategy that's gone in. Um, so, you know, Victoria, with all the funding cuts, Victoria is one of the more lucky states, or I shouldn't use the word lucky, this is the way it should just be, um, that we, that our Premier has put in a creative state strategy, so we do have a lot of initiatives right now. And I think um, I talk, I did spend a lot of my time talking to the infrastructure team at Creative Victoria um, and testing grounds along with the Col new Collingwood Arts Precinct that will eventually go in um, and Acme X that... There's actually a lot of work being, a lot of really interesting and great work being done around that question of, of what is, what does the future of creative spaces look like? Um, and the reason why it, Testing Ground's official tagline is a temporary infrastructure research project is that that emphasis is really on infrastructure um, and research. And the reason before that, because of that is we talk a lot about infrastructure being there as a base level thing. So normally when, you, you know, as an example of something that's architecture, is that you would build something like the art centre that's in its most complete form. And then it gets documented on the opening weekend. And then the rest of its life is people trying to document it um, as it crumbles and they're trying to maintain it and stop it from crumbling. But that's just what buildings and materials do over time, as you would know. <laughs> um, and the difference between that then is the reason why we're infrastructure and not architecture is that it works the other way. So we put down the base level, and this is the reason why the aesthetic of testing ground looks quite unfinished, although there's a lot of thought that goes behind that. Um, and the reason for that is that you put the base level of what artists need, and then you build it up over the years as artists tell you what they think the space should be and how it should be used. So it's not the building that's informing the way that artists work, it's artists informing the building. Uh, yeah. Um, the catch me to that with testing grounds is that by the time we've really figured that out, we'll go away. <laughs> but that goes back to what I was saying before, actually, that once you've fulfilled your need um, as a creative space, that's actually a really good time to just, just shut the doors. Thank you. Um, we're getting close to the sort of end of the discussion, um, but I have, a, I mean, I potentially have a bunch more questions I could ask you guys, um, but um, I thought I might open it up to the floor at first to see if anyone had some questions. Um, I don't think we're going to get the mic over to you, so maybe if you just want to be super vocal, I mean, obviously we can all, you know, you can all hear me without the microphone as I'm demonstrating. It's, it's for the filming. Um, when developers bring them in, it's kind of just a mechanism to bring in market price value to appease people or cover them so that, you know, the owners can then move in. You know, how is it in your practices? Do you either hear a new bidder to this or try and move against it? And how do you think the role of artists can be handled? Okay, yeah, um, I had a huge problem in doing the treatment project that I've heard so much about because I was commissioned by a local city council that was not my own. And I felt a real loyalty to the community that had funded me um, to make a work that was accessible to them. And I talked to a lot of people, I talked to Clara a lot about this um, as it developed in me feeling somewhat guilty 
or like I wasn't the right voice to kind of come in and make this work for a place that wasn't accessible to the community and like find strategies in dealing with that. I think making temporal and like site specific works work really well in combating that issue because it was a free event that was very much pitched at the local community. So they were like invited in very actively, um, but also were a part of the like process and planning. Um, so local government, for all its downsides, is quite good at that, but keeping arts funding, I think, within local government so that it does have community involvement rather than being privately funded or private galleries that are more commercial that tend to, yeah, commodify that space. It's open to the panel. Would you like to? Um, I mean, I think it's sort of a tough sort of um, situation and I think it is inevitable that quite often people get those opportunities and these things come up. But I think it's just really important to, to think about the the relationship or the um, between in like your personal intent, the, the content that you're generating and the medium that it's sort of uh, housed in. And I think that um, between those types of things, it's able to sort of um, have a particular direction and something that sort of... Um, doesn't just sort of like become, as, as, you, as Zoe is sort of saying, like a commodification or something extra, like a surplus to, say, change that's going to commodify the value of your work as like sort of a marketing ploy. Um, and I think that that sort of really means that there needs to be a, like a strong connection and relationship between um, what you're trying to say in your work, what the work actually is, and the medium or the application that's sort of in. Um, because I'm not, yeah, I mean, I'm not really sure what the value, if you get like an empty container and you know it's going to be developed, but the developer contacts you to sort of say, you can put your stuff in it, which helps us sort of say that we care for the community. I don't know how, what that kind of does. Um, it's a tough one because artists are a victim of, of gentrification as well, you know, we lose our live music venues, um, we lose our easily rented studio spaces. I've just been reading a Howard Arkley biography and, you know, they're renting their studio spaces in Paran for 20 bucks a week and they're huge. <laughs> um, I, I think the first key is thinking about where the money is coming from. <laughs> um, that's a really good one. And um, I, you know, I find it hugely problematic and I think about it on any project I'm doing. Um, I think... I felt quite comfortable in Section 32 because those new houses will be $300,000 to purchase, so they're first home buyers' houses. Um, once that house is demolished, that's that's what goes there. Um, but yes, yeah, so I think it's if you're working in public space, it's really important to really critically look at every single opportunity you're taking up and think closely. Um, and then the final thing I'd say is I don't go into every community because I'm not equipped. So there's certain, um, there's certain communities I, I may feel comfortable in going in when I'm 50, but I certainly don't now. And so I choose my projects really, really carefully. Um, you know, I'm very comfortable working with women. I'm comfortable working on certain issues that I've personally experienced. Um, but I, I wouldn't go into an Indigenous community, for example, because I'm in no way equipped to do that. There, um, I think, I mean, I've got a, a, few, a few thoughts about this because it, you know, it depends on what angle you're coming at it from as an independent artist or as an independent curator or someone that works for an institution or all that. Yeah. Um, I think the biggest one of the, what I think about as an artist um, is gentrification is inevitable. And while it's really, it is definitely important to be ethical about it and think about where that money from, one of the biggest things you can do as an independent artist is advocacy for other artists and for yourself. And that is that when these companies say, hey, I've got this, you know, really cool space, why don't you just take it over? Go, okay, and then cost that project properly. Um, and then say, if you want that to happen, it's gonna cost you 20 grand. <laughs> Because there's a lot, you know, you look at the new Renew Newcastle model um, and what they did for a lot of good publicity was say, hey, artists, why don't you occupy all these, all these spaces and shouldn't you be so grateful to get that? And then they didn't pay any of the artists any fees and that's, you know, and that is a really big part. I, I think that's a really big problem 
of gentrification, where if, if we all think about budgeting as advocacy in really writing down what things actually cost, all the way from having invigilators, you know, not getting people to do that for free, then gentrification is kind of inevitable and there's a lot of opportunity to leverage off it as an artist and do great projects. Um, so, as, as I've continued to these projects, I'm really aware that you build a strong relationship with communities and then you move away and that knowledge isn't passed on. So, one of the things I now always put in budgets is a publication at the end of the project and I put one of those in the local library and I give one to whoever funded the project. And in that, I often talk about planning. You know, that's something I'm really, really interested in. So, one of the things that came from Section 32 is, is was talking about ensuring that the original community isn't priced out. So I get to put that in that document and there is a permanent record of that and that goes in an archive um, that's publicly accessible like a library. So I think that can be a really interesting way of, of course it takes a lot of resources and energy and I often only, often takes me kind of 12 months after a project to get that publication out, but it can be a really great way of shoring up some of those insecurities. Anyone else in the audience have any more questions? Um, I'm kind of curious um, for uh, to kind of again talk like talking about issues surrounding funding and support. Um, you know, almost all of you guys. It's always interesting running a panel talk like this because often some of the synchronicities you're aware of at the beginning of a talk, and other times it takes sitting amongst a panel and asking them questions when you realise um, some of the further connections and I kind of, it's interesting hearing about you guys kind of talking about network sort of making and place making, whether that's, whether that's, you know, parallel as a, as a network, as a circuit, as a kind of nebula for a broader discourse um, or whether that's looking at engaging with the community and kind of responding to their history and kind of trying to give back in a certain way. Um, and I'm, I'm kind of curious, um, Colby, to ask you a little bit more about the future for Parallel and kind of where your thoughts are on, on what you'd like to do next with the, with the um, organisation. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that we're sort of in a really interesting phase at the moment where we're sort of restructuring, so to speak, um, because the intention, again, and this is this sort of balance between the, the outcomes or the output and the, the intentions, um, where we still sort of stand by at this idea of creating um, a, a global or sort of international community um, uh, through like different disciplines and sort of against locations and all this kind of stuff. Um, and the, this, the key idea is this decentralization of the platform. Um, but because the, it sort of was generated originally by three people from the same location, from the same background, um, we realized very quickly it's actually not sustainable to generate this network in that particular way because all of our sort of friends and people that we're, we're sort of associated with are from the same sphere or the same sort of area. And so it's actually, we've been spending a long time now trying to establish this sort of international um, dialogue and sort of create this network that we're talking about because we really think that in order to, to do what you sort of say, you need to have this sort of infrastructure, so to speak, whether it's physically members, so people in different places doing different things um, and having these sort of ideas. But I think um, the, the idea or the future of Parallel is sort of, yeah, this decentralization. So we're not interested in it sort of being Melbourne-based um, and people uh, sort of uh, engage with it overseas. The idea is that it sort of always happens in between. So something might be happening here, whether it's a panel discussion, say in Melbourne with people in, um, I don't know, Tokyo or Paris or whatever. Um, and it's not about those two physical locations. It's about the in-between and the decentralization that it creates. So I guess we're at that stage at the moment so that we can actually act out what we want to do in the future. Thank you. Um, again, does anyone have any other questions for any of the panel? Members, um, well, I guess we'll maybe call that the 
a kind of resolution of this conversation, if you can call a conversation resolved, um, at least explored. Um, there are some refreshments at the entrance, um, so feel free to stick around for a little bit. But just really quickly before we finish, I've just got a tiny bit of like housekeeping to do. One, um, obviously the backs of all of your heads will be in this film. Um, if any of you don't want to appear um, online in a video, just let me know. Um, and we will, I don't know, find a fun way to censor your existence um, <laughs> away. Um, and um, so for those of you that maybe are new to the program, you can watch um, our previous discussion on YouTube. Um, uh, if you just type in RMIT Link Arts and Culture, um, I think it comes up then. Um, but also just letting you guys know that, um, I guess, two more things. One, um, so we will have a, these panel discussions are roughly monthly. We will have um, one coming up soon. But the next event that's part of Critical that I'm kind of excited to talk about is, um, so Critical, this is the second year of Critical to run as a program. But last year it was run a little differently. And we had um, the, the public, the workshops and lectures and things like that weren't public. Um, and they were... Um, provided for a um, selected group of students um, and to help develop their critical writing. And that critical writing has actually been compiled into an anthology and we're launching that on, off the top of my head, Tuesday the 13th of June, um, which is very exciting. You can take a copy of the book home if it interests you, but also... Um, part of my discussion um, surrounding sort of the future of arts writing and the place that arts writing has currently. Um, the um, launch will be opened by Tessa Laird, who is a, um, well, she teaches in critical theory at the BCA, but she also um, is one of the editors of the new, newly revived Art in Australia. Um, and so if any of you guys are interested in that, or I can see some people who are published as part of that anthology in the audience, come along to support them or just to have, I don't know, can to congratulate everyone. Um, but finally, um, before, I, before I let you all go, um, this element of critical is only one sort of part of the program. The second part of the program is a series of fortnightly workshops that happen, not here at First Sight Gallery, but in a classroom at RMIT. And they're kind of dedicated to arts writing, but but specifically looking at maybe what anyone interested in writing, and when I say arts writing, it's really loose, whether it's like part of your arts practice, whether it's critical, whether it's journalistic, anything. Um, we're kind of looking at the things that maybe aren't getting taught specifically in people's areas of study. So we've done stuff on like building your brand as a writer or looking at like how to write an artist statement that can be indicative of your practice but can also be kind of used in varieties of different contexts. Um, but yeah, it's a really kind of ev everyone is the students involved at the moment are from huge backgrounds. Some people have never written before. Some people are like in the middle of their PhD and write all the time. But if it's something that interests you um, and you'd like to get involved in any way, um, stick around after this and you can um, say hi. I'd like to be able to um, give everyone a round of applause and thank these guys for talking. <laughs> <laughs>